Yes. Hi, I'm Daphne from the Bar Council Environment and Climate Change Committee. I'm the MC for this webinar, Director's Duties and Climate Change, co-organized by the Bar Council Environment and Climate Change Committee and Climate Governance Malaysia. I'd like to now invite Dr. Sri Sunita Rajakumar of Climate Governance Malaysia to give her introduction to this webinar. Datin Sri Sunita is the founding chairperson of Climate Governance Malaysia. Thank you so much, Daphne. Climate Governance Malaysia is so pleased to be collaborating with the Bar Council on this important topic of director's duties and climate change. A very special thank you to the Bar Council President and the Chairman of the Bar Council's Environment and Climate Change Committee. It is clear the nature of climate change has evolved from being an environmental concern to one that presents material financial risks and opportunities. We are seeing increasing changes in weather patterns, leading to unexpected storms, floods and extreme heat days from the Dandenong Range in Australia to villages in Germany and China to wildfires in the United States and of course droughts in Africa. Businesses are significant emitters of greenhouse gases and allocators of capital are demanding for more disclosure so they can make informed decisions about where the capital will flow, about the quality of board and management, whether they are capable of making the transition which the world urgently needs. Directors as long-term stewards entrusted by the owners of the company have a duty of due care and diligence to anticipate and manage clearly foreseeable financial risks arising from the climate crisis, whether physical or transition risks. In addition, legal counsel have an inherent tension in their roles as both partner to the business, where they shepherd deals across the finish line, and as a guardian to the business, where the board of directors depends on their counsel to avoid incurring foreseeable liability. We have spent a lot of time carefully curating a wide variety of views for you today. Our panel comprises highly respected corporate lawyer Topuan Janet Lui, a longtime supporter of CGM, who will share her views of the evolving legal landscape. And Karina Lidvak, calling in live from London, the non-executive director who has been championing the Climate Governance Initiative for at least five years and single-handedly persuaded the World Economic Forum to adopt it. Their stimulating conversation will be moderated by Q Jiayao, committed advocate for sustainable development, who serves on the Bar Council Environment and Climate Change Committee. We are so excited to have the intergenerational equity perspective from Ecology, University Malaya Mood Competition winners, law undergraduates, who wanted to share their views with us. And of course, our keynote speaker for today, we will hear from the lawmaker's perspective what our national trajectory could be. Tansri Richard Malanjum has been advocating environmental protection for at least 15 years, and during his tenure as Chief Justice, was instrumental in proposing a change to the rules of court which would have allowed individuals, NGOs, and even animals, I believe, to bring causes of action against polluters. I'm so pleased that the Bar Council is hosting this with us. This sends such a strong tone from the top that the climate emergency is a critical issue to them. Most of all, thank you to our audience for your support and your time today. We are depending on each of you to maintain the momentum started today to move this conversation forward. Thank you. Back to you, Daphne. Thank you, Datin Sri. So I would like to now invite the President of the Malaysian Bar, Mr. A.G. Kalidas, to give his welcome address. Thank you, Daphne. Tan Sri Datuk Sri Panglima Richard Malanjong. Datin Sri Sunita Rajakumar, esteemed panelists, members of the bar, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to this webinar this evening. 
and I would like to express my thanks to Datin Sri Sunita Rajakumar and Climate Governance Malaysia for collaborating with the Malaysian Bar to organize this very important discussion. Climate change and sustainable development needs to be part of everyone's agenda. Article 5 of the Federal Constitution provides that no person shall be deprived of his life or personal li liberty save in accordance with the law. This must include the right to live in a reasonably healthy and pollution-free environment. The complex changes posed by climate change are not problems for the government alone to solve. It affects our daily lives and is a risk to businesses. Everyone will be impacted by climate change. It will take nothing less than an all of society approach. In recent years, we have witnessed more corporate social responsibility, CSR measures undertaken by corporations in responding to issue of climate change. I'm pleased that many of our participants today are from the private sector. Many are board members or business advisors. I hope that the knowledge and insights you will gain from this webinar will encourage and empower you to take leadership. To courageously chart paths that ultimately align with the broader aspiration of Malaysians. Paths that's, that in the long run will make Malaysian businesses more competitive and our economy more robust, resilient and sustainable. In this, lawyers have a big role to play too. As legal advisors and facilitators in the business world, it is vital that you do not fall in obsolescence and end up becoming obstacles to the change we need, which is why I'm very encouraged by the large number of you attending this webinar today. The science and politics behind climate change, the climate change legal frameworks and innovative application of legal principles in climate litigation are all unfamiliar to many of us, especially when extrapolated to expectations on businesses. It calls into question the role of businesses in society. My fellow lawyers, we must be prepared to unlearn much of what we know and relearn in the context of our reality. To put it in simple words, there can be no businesses in the future if we do not address climate change today. Ladies and gentlemen, it is important to have diversity of perspectiveness on today's topic. It is evident from the program today that we will be considering the subject matter of today's discussion from diverse perspectives. We will benefit from the vast experience of our former Chief Justice, Tan Sri Richard Malanjong. Here, the urgent but hopeful message of the next generation lawyers and engage with local and international experts on director's duties. So I welcome you again and I look forward to a lively session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kalidas. I'd like to now invite Mr. Roger Chan, the chairperson of the Bar Council Environment and Climate Change Committee to say a few words. Thank you very much, uh, Daphne. Uh, can I be heard? Thank you. Yeah. Young Mulia Tan Sri Richard Malanjun, Datin Sunita, Mr. A.G. Kalidas, President of Malaysian Bar, members of Malaysian Bar, corporate leaders, ladies and gentlemen. Let me, on behalf of the Environmental and Climate Change Committee of the Bar Council Malaysia, welcome all of you to this webinar entitled Director's Duties and Climate Change. If we live in an era 50 years ago, you may be able to sense a disconnect between the two. For one represent a playing field centered in or related to boardroom activities, and the other an investigative 
field of science more towards a global warming phenomenon. Not anymore in the present time and age, directors' duties and climate change are becoming more and more inseparable. In a recent NASA study, it is said that the tropical forest ability to absorb carbon dioxide is waning. The decline in this ability is because of large scale deforestation, habitat de degradation, and climate change effects like more frequent droughts and fires. Invariably, the link to business as usual is not at all tenuous. In short, the role of directors in formulating climate change related decisions has become increasingly important. The Environmental and Climate Change Committee of the Bar Council, ECCC in short, is delighted to be a partner in collaboration with the climate governance of Malaysia in this regard and fully supports the development of its project to publish the primer on climate change, director's duties and its disclosure obligations. May I wish them all the best in this noble endeavor. Not forgetting though, ecology. The ECCC will always support and in frequent engagement with you as you are the torch bearers of the generation to come to inherit this place that we all try to make as environmentally hospitable for everybody. To the panelists, and participants, which I'm told is a record number today, have a good and constructive discussion. Thanking you from the bottom of my heart, as always. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. With, with pleasure, um, we would like to now invite Tan Sri Richard Malamjung, the former Chief Justice of Malaysia, to deliver the keynote address. To ensure that no technical glitches, we've pre-recorded Tan Sri's speech. But Tan Sri is with us in the audience right now. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Thank you very much for being present this evening. And uh, I wish, first of all, to thank the organizer, in particular, Latin Sunita, for inviting me to deliver this short uh, address. Uh, I've been on retirement for the last uh, almost three years now. And uh, I thought I could uh, do my own things, but uh, obviously it's interesting to get involved, especially when it comes to environment. Uh, this evening, <clears throat> the target of our webinar is not the usual uh, topics. Yeah, this time it is targeted on companies, and uh, I, I think it's high time to do it because uh, all this while a lot of discussion about the environment towards uh, the academic aspect of it or the uh, even on the government side. So <clears throat> this evening, uh, we are going to discuss, or at least the panelists will be going to discuss on how we can get the companies involved in the fight against climate change. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, <clears throat> there have been a lot of perception as regards uh, companies and uh, their directors. Uh, when we talk about environment and climate change, 
immediately we remember or we think of the culprits, the big corporation, the Exxon and so forth. But we never look at the other aspect of it. Uh, we always think that these big companies are there only to make money and to pollute the world. I think the time has changed for us to change that perception in a way that instead of just taking the negative side of big cooperation, we must engage them, and help us to fight uh, on climate, against climate change and also to, to fight against environmental degradation. Now, <clears throat> we should ask this question, what can the companies do to help? Why must they help? And how can they help? I think these are pertinent questions that we should ask ourselves. And I hope the panelists uh, will gear towards this direction. And uh, I'll be very much focused on Malaysia and uh, to see how we are in climate change and especially when it comes to the legislation aspect of it. All the while we have been talking about legislation uh, from the criminal aspect. If we look at our laws, it only deals with the criminal aspect of uh, climate change and environmental uh, uh, protection. But never have we ever considered the civil aspect. There are a few cases that was brought to court, that were brought to court to, to, to challenge. But uh, I don't think there have been much success in that area. So today, ladies and gentlemen, we hope to discuss that and possibly come up with uh, suggestions. And that will make this webinar more meaningful instead of uh, just NATO, you know, uh, no action talk only. Now, <clears throat> the suffering of the world today is the result of so many factors. We are now over 7 billion. The question now is whether the world resources is enough or not to maintain the 7 billion people living in this planet. The other factors is the, uh, the greed and the arrogance of today's uh, world corporate leaders as well as political leaders. We are also, we have also become too ambitious. We want to do things in our own way. We have, have the sense of invisibility and as if we have an eternal life in, on earth. These are things, in my view, ladies and gentlemen, that has caused a lot of problems to the world today. There's enough uh, resources in this world for everybody, as Mahatma Gandhi said, but he has, it's not enough to satisfy our greed. And that's how it is at the moment, in my view. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> as I have started just now, what, why, and how companies can help. This is what I think it can be done. The company can assist if we engage them. That includes the director, yeah? To help us in many ways, in various fields, especially in the areas where it has caused a lot of uh, pollution, in the agricultural sector, in the mining sector, in the manufacturing sector, in the plantation sectors. So these are areas that companies should be invited to help out. 
unfortunately, for now, <clears throat> many of these companies, in my view, are either not aware of what is happening. They have, taken, they have taken things for granted. Or two, they don't know what to do. And even if they know, they don't know how to do it. And three, they don't know why they have to do it. So it is our responsibility, especially in the legal fraternity, to show them that the law is not only a punitive in nature, a deterrent in nature, but also in the restorative uh, side of it, as we call normally call it restorative justice. Now, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, these two aspects, one is a punitive aspect and one is a restorative aspect, must really be looked at. We have left a lot of the legislations, as I said early on, very much towards criminal aspect. The time has come for us to re-examine this situation. Take, for example, in <clears throat> Malaysia. If we look at the legislation, we are still stuck to the Environmental Quality Act, Act of 1974, EQA, they call it. <clears throat> and if you look at that act, the main focus there is on criminal side, offenses commission, committed by individuals and companies. And in particular, no doubt, Section 43 of the Act speak of personal liability of directors and so forth. But I have said before that that Act is very much confined to actually very much to pollution. There is nothing to cover on other areas of human activities, yeah? For example, deforestation, mining, and uh, huge uh, animal farming, and so forth. All these actually do cause uh, the pollution in a way that they emit uh, <coughs> CO2 in you know, the atmosphere, carbon carbon, and as a result, it has effect on our environment, on our <coughs> uh, ozone layer. So ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> what can we do from the legal aspect? I think it is time to have a real look at all the laws relating to this kind of industries. We can start to revamp them and to look at from the civil aspect, not necessarily criminal. And then we can provide the means or a channel how to it, how to enforce it. And of course, we all are away in Malaysia here, which we are very much still lacking. Our courts are still stuck to the old law of locus standi. I think the time has come to have a relook at it. No doubt now that we have shifted from uh, Lim Ket Siang of sufficient uh, interest to adversely affected in the MTUC case and the QSR case. But in my view, that's still not good enough. If we look at the Philippine side, yeah, only through court rules that they manage to open up literally everybody to come to court to commence a legal action, civil, uh, in order to prevent pollution, in order to prevent uh, any other activities that may pollute the environment. 
And that is why even in other countries, we have heard about recently in Australia where school, a student, a young student went to court to stop an expansion of coal mining. There is no reason why we cannot do that in Malaysia. So all we need now, ladies and gentlemen, is to empower the NGOs, the activists, and the civil society, not to depend only on the prosecutors here, yeah, but to be able to make a decision to ensure that the laws are observed by companies. So there you are. We can invite the companies to help out. And that is why they should get involved. Because if they don't, then we can then bring them to justice. My view is this. The reason why the companies and their directors are not so much involved today is that there's hardly suit against companies, negligence or otherwise. So if we can amend our law, if only the rules of court can be amended, of which moves have been done, steps have been taken, but uh, so far it's stuck somewhere. And I understand that one of the big issues is on the local standard. Some smart Alex says that, oh, it is a substantive law and it should not therefore be put under the rules. But if you look at the Philippines, rules, that is where you find the local standard being provided for. I would have thought that those who said no to it, to include the local standard provision in the proposed rules, we should come up with a suggestion. Where then will you put it? Are you going to put that in the Court of Judicature Act? Are you going to put that in the Civil Law Act? Or are you going to put that wherever you can think you think is right? But you can't simply object and say, oh, local standard, it must be sensitive law and leave it as it is. We will not move. Or are you going to leave with the court? The judges will be stuck by the precedent, will be, will be bound by those precedents. So can you imagine the problem? So it, this is the point, ladies and gentlemen, and I just hope the panelists can discuss this seriously because it's a serious question. And I think that this is the main problem that we are facing today. And that is the reason, in my view, that there are very few public interest investigation pertaining to environment. There's no point to go when you can't even take the first step. You'll be struck down purely on the issue of locust and die. So I hope that this issue can be discussed in this webinar and come up with a solution. And the other thing that, uh, <clears throat> that I would suggest is that <clears throat> there should be more open discussion on uh, climate change by uh, companies, yeah? directors of companies. It's only because, uh, through awareness, I think that things will improve. And if they're aware that their companies can be subject to legal suits, things I think will change. They'll be more careful in whatever activities they're doing. So ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I have nothing much to say, except that I just hope this issue of legislative changes can be addressed the sooner the better. And we can therefore encourage our students to take up environmental law and make it a mandatory subject, if possible. And lawyers can be met or can, can be encouraged to do public interest litigation. I know there's no much, not much money to make there. But if we can get the companies yeah, to come up, set up a funding, 
and through that funding, legal costs can be it can be used for legal to pay legal costs. That would be a good start. So once again, thank you organizers for inviting me. I know that uh, I may have not uh, said a pleasing things, but uh, that's how it is. We got to face realities. And uh, I wish you all a happy discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tansri Richard. Now we would like to share a brief presentation by a few law students from University Malaya Law Faculty Ecology. They have recently concluded a moot competition developed around climate change litigation. And here is their short pre-recorded message to us. Good evening to fellow speakers, Mr. Moderator and fellow environmental enthusiasts. My name is Joanna John. I'm actually the former director of ecology. So on behalf of the current board, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Q for giving us this opportunity to represent the youths which we believe are immensely important in the discussion of environment issues. We endeavor for our voices to be heard as we the youths are the voice of change. So to us youths and students, directors of companies play a big role in boosting the country's economy whilst providing us with a great future. However, all of these will be less significant if it affects our livelihood and our future generations. So one might wonder how it affects our livelihood and looking into past examples or events that have occurred throughout the past years. Poor regulated incineration in factories pose a considerable threat to human health and the environment and the constant need to have buildings and constructions that is partly responsible for carbon emissions. Now, these are the examples of contributors to climate change. And that being said, even members of the judiciary in the Philippines recognizes that every generation has a responsibility to the next generation. And that includes preserving a healthy and balanced ecosystem. So with um, that being said, um, Ecology this year, we actually collaborated with UM Mood Club in hosting a mood competition where students like us, uh, we get to pretend to be like real lawyers and submit our case in front of experienced judges and lawyers. And this year's team was on climate change. So the reason why we decided to have an environmental team competition is to expose students to the available um, environmental related laws in Malaysia and to emphasize the importance of fighting against climate change. So the direct impact of climate change can be seen in the decreased water availability, uh, degradation of natural resources, and the most, obvious, uh, the most obvious one in Malaysia would be the increase of temperature. So we trust that decisions made by directors is one of the ways to ensure that our environment is protected in hopes to combat climate change. So without further ado, um, I shall pass the next few minutes to Abbas and Shalini to share their experience and views in relation to climate change. Good evening to fellow speakers, Mr. Moderator, and all fellow listeners. My name is Abdullah Abbas, and today I speak on my capacity as the best oralist for the IEMC, which is Internal Environment Mood Competition, which is a mooting competition based on environmental law and climate change issues. I had the opportunity to actually delve into actual problem of enforcing legal protection of the environment against climate change, in which I believe most of us here are aware of its creeping effect. During my research, a particular concept that caught my attention was the duties of directors of companies in relation to climate change. For me, it is an extension of their duties that stem from their primary duty to maximize profits for the companies and the shareholder values. Although it might look profitable for companies to continue what they have been doing to maximize its profit by the end of each term, no short-term benefits could ever await long-term consequences. And based on that logic, came the idea that directors 
need to actually ensure that the company will continue to survive to make profits in the future. And to do that, changes are necessary. It is because it is important for the company to continue to survive for long term instead of just continue to make profits within the three to four years. We have to actually look at the long term benefits of actually taking care of the environment. And since the mood competition that I had, there has been recent court decision that actually revolutionized that change is definitely coming for environmental protection nowadays. For example, in Australia, there is a landmark case called Sharma and Minister of Environment, in which in that case, it creates a novel duty of care on the Minister of Environment to actually consider the effect of climate change against the future generation in making a decision that would definitely affect the environment. Although such concept has yet to reach our shore in Malaysia, sooner or later it will come to us and it will open new doors that would apply the same duty and the same concept against the directors so that they need to consider the effect of climate change towards future generation in continuing their traditional business practice. And I think it is sufficient to say that change will come and it is up to you if you want to be the one who initiated that change and work progress for that change, or if you want to be the one who is resistant to a change and work against it. And history had always proven to us that those who refuse to change will not survive. And the fact is very clear for me. It's either we change or the climate change. And we all know which had more devastating effect on us all. With that, I wish to say that I am very looking forward to the discussion on director's duties in the next session from the, from the speakers that we have. And it is our hope as the current generation that you will be part of the change that we all need to create a better future for all of us. Thank you. Good evening to fellow speakers, Mr. Moderator and fellow fervent supporters of the philosophy of environmentalism. My name is Shalini Sri Kumar, and I was the best oralist for the novice stream in IEMC that was held in early April this year. The more problem that we got was primarily on climate change, and some of the challenges that I faced in dealing with the MOOC problem was that Malaysia does not have any legislation pertaining to climate change. Malaysian case laws surrounding environmental law litigation are scant, so most of our authorities were from common law countries. The MOOC problem also included details of reclamation activities and its impacts onto the environment and subsequently our livelihoods both the activity of land reclamation and the materials and pollutants generated during the activity are detriment to the water quality, hence they catalyze the pollution of the marine environment. Reclamation processes also result in greenhouse gas emissions, which is the heart of climate change. As youth, we believe that it is fundamental to advocate about the issues of climate change and subsequently for a change, a solution. In UM and many other fields, change has manifested. On par with the youth, directors of companies share equal, if not more, responsibility in contributing to this change. It is very admirable to see some financiers in calculating the financial risk in a company's operation to question if, for example, the business would require cutting down of an old forest or if investors can be sued for climate change. In fact, I believe this webinar today with all the members present, despite it being a working day, substantiates even further the fact that the first step towards a healthier Mother Earth has been taken. The Dutch jurisprudence recently in May this year was pre presented with a case against Shell. The issue was whether Shell violated its duty of care under the Dutch law and human rights obligation owing to its failure in taking adequate measures to curbing climate change. The Dutch court passed a landmark ruling ordering Royal Dutch Shell to reduce carbon emissions by 45% by the year 2030. Now this ruling, a ruling held by the plaintiffs, is a decision 
it was not only historic, but also a remarkable win in the fight against climate change. As the common but frank saying goes, we are living on this earth as if we have another one to go to, must be called to mind. I'd like to believe that we are holding Mother Earth in trust for the future generation. Hence, as human beings, I urge that we really start taking responsibility in ensuring that we leave this earth in a better state than we found it in. We must realize that our country is not as susceptible as it may seem, and we cannot afford to just sit without betting an eyelid just because the risk levels here are low. Hence, change must happen, and it must happen from the top. As leaders, directors must do justice to their roles in curbing climate change. I look forward to the discussion today. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And that's our future speaking to us. Now I'd like to invite Mr. Kyu Jia Yao, co-deputy chairperson of the Bar Council Environment and Climate Change Committee to come on as the moderator for the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Daphne. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, wherever you're joining us from. I've been really looking forward to this conversation with Karina and Jeanette, as well as with you, the participants of this discussion. And my, uh, we do have an amazing amount uh, of people with us here uh, at this webinar. Um, it is as encouraging as it is humbling to, to have all of you here. So thank you. Uh, one housekeeping matter uh, is for lawyers and chambering pupils, the link for you to record your attendance and get your CPD points will be shared in the chat box at the end of the session. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing our panelists. Yes, so uh, first of all is Top One, Janet Louis. Uh, she is a senior partner of Screen, one of the largest law firms in Malaysia. Janet leads the corporate division of the firm as well as its environmental practice. Janet has long been widely recognized for her work in takeovers, mergers and acquisitions, cross-border transactions, and much more. So a, well, a warm welcome to the panel, Janet. Thank you very much. Now, let me introduce Ms. Karina Lidvak, who is joining us from London. Karina serves on the boards of multiple organizations, including the Italian oil and gas major, any SPA. Coming from a background in finance, Karina now plays a leading role in sustainability and governance uh, in business. Under the auspices of the World Economic Forum, Karina co-founded the Climate Governance Initiative, CGI, which has developed the CGI principles for non-executive directors. I'm delighted to have you on the panel, Karina. Welcome. So here's how our panel session will go. There will be, broadly speaking, two parts. In the first part, I will invite Janet and Karina to lay the foundations for our discussion on directors' duties and climate change. Janet will share about directors' duties in Malaysia and the developments of these duties here in response to climate change. Then Karina will share about the primer on climate change, which is a recent document which sets out the key principles that board directors must know, as well as a compilation of the legal position on directors' duties and climate change across many countries. And then in the second half of this session, we will then have a more conversational discussion, hopefully engaging more with our audience. So as we go along, uh, please put forward your questions and your comments in the Q&A box, not the comment box, but the Q&A box. Yeah, I look forward to that because that's gonna to contribute to our conversation. So let us begin then. Uh, Janet, um, would you like to start with your presentation, please? Sure, thank you very much, Jayo. And uh, thank you very much to the Bar uh, Council Committee and the Climate Governance Malaysia uh, for this uh, opportunity. Um, I will share my slides. Um, So to, to begin with, um, we have to look at, you know, what is the environment in which um, our directors are now operating on the boards? Um, and of course, you know, there is a big um, effect on the earth already um, in relation to climate change. We can see all of it. And, um, you know, uh, Western Malaysia has uh, pushed uh, for certain things and uh, the climate uh, science uh, is already starting a wave of litigation. 
and um, there there have been the the recent floods in the Europe, which uh, really you know devastating, and it's very evident for all to see. So. In terms of being on the board um, and in terms of advising our clients, um, there is a need to discuss uh, how the three dimensions of risk in mitigating climate risk will take place. And the three dimensions are very briefly, and this is a subject that can go on for many pages, transit, physical, of course, from climate related events, transition, risk for adjustment to a low carbon economy and liability from uh, inaction. And um, the liability part um, result, results in legal suits and so on. Now the IEA has already said that global emissions must reduce by 40% by 2030 uh, if we are to reach carbon neutrality by 2050, which the science says is absolutely critical. And Malaysia's own goals are to reduce by 45% of the GHG emissions by 2030 relative to the emissions um, in 2005. So this, this is a part already of the, of the scenario that we live in. Um, and also directors should also be con conscious that, you know, there is already evidence um, that companies that increase carbon emissions, um, their performance actually uh, goes down. And this is the, um, dark blue line in this slide, and those that have reduced their performances have gone up. And so these are all evidence already. Now, in terms of climate litigation and uh, our ecology uh, speakers have mentioned this um, in their, in their um, intergenerational concerns that they shared with us. Now, there are already evidence that in terms of climate litigation around the world, we already see that you know breach of due diligence um, and to act in the best interest of the company and shareholders. There's been a successful claim brought by Client Earth against the Polish power generation company, um, and that case held that the board resolution approving the power plan was legally invalid, of course under Polish company law. Um, then breach of duty of care and failure to provide information. Again, um, this one there was a pension fund member that sued for breach of duty of care um, and uh, the violation was of the Corporations Act for failing to provide information related to climate change, business risk and any plans to address those. And also there have been a number of cases against Exxon um, where, and, and in 2018 there was one where you know, the plaintiff alleged that there was a strong inference that Exxon um, the board as well had misrepresented the value of the assets as it had not taken into account climate risks. So if we move to the scenario in Malaysia, uh, we will see that, you know, directors are really at the center of more than just what it is on this, on this slide, um, but certainly they play a factor in, you know, the obligations that directors have to uh, comply with. Um, in terms of reporting and in terms of duties um, that, they, that they have. I, I'd like to say that these are minimum requirements only. They are not, uh, they're not to say that this is all that needs to be complied with. And we hear very much, you know, Tan Sri Richard Walan Jun's uh, comments earlier that, um, you know, companies have to be stewards in this area. And so this is a minimum threshold, but it's important to point them out, especially for the lawyers in the audience, um, that they do exist so that there is a risk mitigation approach and that uh, directors uh, are aware that these obligations already exist. And uh, I'll discuss this a little bit more in the next few slides. So um, we've got the main market requirements um, about uh, adopting the MCCG practices for large companies. We have also um, the SC guidelines the recent, uh, most recently, 12 April 2021, um, that, that has been updated. But as of the beginning of the year, there was already a requirement for the directors to um, comply with the basically duty to act in the best interest of the companies, which is actually in section 213 of the Companies Act. So it's a reiteration of the Companies Act's obligation, but it allows the Securities Commission to act uh, where, there, where there is a breach. So here we are, Section 213 of the Companies Act, um, 
it encapsulates the requirements for duty to act for proper purpose, good faith, in good faith, and best interest of the company, and also the duty of reasonable care, skill, and diligence. And a conviction here, you know, could result in a five years um, imprisonment or $3 million fine, or both. But at the end of the day, um, it is not about the penalties um, that directors should only be concerned about. It is also about, you know, the other aspects of um, the value of the company, the ability to ensure that, you know, the, the company has plans um, to mitigate against climate risks. So now, um, how, how has the court decided in terms of directors' duties and to look at whether they fulfill that duties. The federal court in um, the Petra case has uh, said that it's a subjective test as well as an objective test. And what does that mean? That means that um, in terms of the um, objective test, it's um, you know what an honest, intelligent man in the same position would do. And from a subjective position, whether you know you're with, whether you are already. Um, doing something with your knowledge, additional knowledge, skill and experience and your knowledge, skill and experience reasonably accepted a position, a, pers a director in the same position. Now, there is a business judgment rule and this is a topic that we will discuss more later. Um, this is something that uh, we will talk about as to whether, you know, directors can, based on the business judgment rule, be able to um, have a defence. And again, what are the criteria? Um, this is very briefly set out here. I won't go into this um, to the same extent that is on the slides, but I do want to say that um, the business judgment rule does not automatically provide directors a defense where a director has failed to make a conscious decision or he does not exercise his judgment to properly inform himself of the relevant facts or circumstances. So that's, that's really important. So it's not a matter of just, you know, saying, well, you know, I, I think that, you know, this is in the best interest of the company and that's the end of it. And um, going further on the environment uh, in which a director acts, of course, um, we all know that um, the, the MCCG, as I mentioned earlier, and the MMLR um, are in play. And what do they require? The MCCG does require the board leadership and oversight um, integrate sustainability con considerations in your strategy and also in discharging responsibilities, um, ensure that the strategic plan supports a long-term value creation. And, and these um, tenets um, are repeated um, in a few places. Um, there is also the main market listing requirements, which requires directors to provide an overview statement on the application of each of the principles in the MCCG, and um, a requirement for an explain um, if you uh, apply or if you depart, then what is your alternative practice. Now, in the annual report obligations also, apart from the sustainability statement, there is also a requirement for a statement containing management discussions and analysis of operations. And as part of this requirement, any identified anticipated or known risk that the group is exposed to, which may have material effect on the operations, um, are to be discussed and included together with a discussion of the plans or strategies to mitigate such risk. And also a forward-looking statement providing commentary on the group's possible outlook and sustainability of each of its principal business segment. This will be something that more and more um, the boards need to take, you know, cognizance that these requirements are already there. And to what extent does the company have a specific plan, a specific identification of the risks of climate, um, climate, climate events on its business and on the present assets that it has and whether it affects evaluation. And this is a discussion that, um, you know, has to um, be more elevated in the board's agenda and be more frequent. Um, and, and it's no longer just something that, you know, we can kick the can down the, the, the line because we can already see the effects. In terms of the audited financial statements as well, um, directors need to be aware of, um, you know, and to be conscious that, you know, 
whether that the financial statements really do give a true and fair view of the financial position of the company. Um, and, uh, you know, just some uh, factors will be, you know, whether the directors are aware of any circumstances which would render any amount in the accounts misleading, for example. And also um, the directors um, report business review. At the moment, it's uh, may include, but, um, you know, that will, that, that if you do include it, then you have to say which of the statements it does not include. Um, so just touching on the last uh, part of this then, um, of course, there's all the other um, acts that, you know, need to be complied with. And the Environmental Quality Act, of, I hear Tan Sri Richard uh, Melanjin's comment that it is out of date. Um, but at the same time, of course, uh, we have the situation that the act already exists and has very broad provisions um, prohibiting discharge of environmentally hazardous substances. And uh, Section 43 was mentioned by Tan Sri, and that can incur, directors and officers can incur uh, personal liability if it does not have a system in place to prevent the occurrence of the offences. There is also um, hope that the Climate Change Act will finally come into being. So, you know, with this in mind, um, the only other thing that I would add is that in relation to the Companies Act provisions that were discussed, those are actually encapsulation of common law obligations. And these common law obligations are the ones that the companies should be aware could lead to breach of uh, negligence, breach of duty of care, and negligence suits can be brought. And so, you know, through that route, notwithstanding that we may have uh, now a local standard issue still, and therefore very little public interest litigation, that route um, was successfully used in Australia by the teenagers who, you know, sued um, the government to say that, you know, you have to take action to um, ensure that, you know, my, my, my environment is, is clean and protected. The negligence route and the other tortious routes are already available. So on that note, I will, I will leave, uh, let JIL come back in and, uh, you know, uh, take us to the next part of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Janet. I, you have uh, done a masterclass in, uh, in a compressed time of uh, uh, 11 or 12 minutes. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and, and, and that lays a, a really solid uh, groundwork. I think you've touched on all the uh, legislative basis as well as the direction of where our regulatory bodies are going. So now um, next, uh, I would like to invite Karina. Karina, uh, can we talk about um, the primer on climate change and, and maybe to the audience, I just want to lay a little bit of background on uh, why uh, it's, it's, it's really important to hear Karina's uh, work um, in, in our context here. Uh, because Karina has been working on uh, this collaboration with the Commonwealth Climate and Law Initiative and the Climate uh, Governance Initiative uh, to, to build on this uh, wonderful piece of uh, a, a compilation, if I could say, of, of what are the really key principles that um, board directors need to pay attention to uh, today. And, and uh, we'd love to hear from Karina in terms of uh, the background of this project in a quickly, maybe in about uh, four to five minutes about the why of the project, um, um, the process, who is it intended for, how, should, how can they use this? Yeah, Karina, over to you. Thank you very much. And um, what my remarks are going to be kind of a prequel to what you just heard from Janet, because she went straight into the meat of the issue. But I want to stop for a second and, 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 and explain why we even went uh, ahead with this project. So it really boils down to, very selfishly, my personal experience, which is that I was elected to the board of an oil and gas major just over seven years ago. I was nominated by the institutional investors uh, who wanted to bring onto that board somebody who had both international expertise, it's an Italian company, and sustainability expertise. And my first rather painful realization was that despite a 25 year career in finance, and in particular specializing in sustainable finance and focusing on climate change, as a director, I didn't know what to do. You know, so as an investor, I thought directors have to do this. It's their job. They should just get on with it. As a director, I realized I didn't have the tools. The first thing then that I encountered, the first roadblock I encountered was fellow directors in my board, in many, many other boards, who basically put up their hands and said, if we act, 
in a manner that is consistent with the scientific consensus, uh, but that is way ahead of the political consensus, we will be putting ourselves in breach of our legal obligations because we will necessarily be leaving profitable business on the table. By the way, that's such a tired phrase. Um, and, 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 and our job is to deliver profits to our clients. Now, for me as an investor, that rang lots of bells because back in the early 2000s, there was a very lively legal debate about whether pension funds had an obligation to maximize returns at all costs or take into account longer term issues, stakeholder issues and so forth. And the legal community came down in favor of this more holistic view. So I thought there's, there's something wrong here and we need to get we need to get help. We need to get a legal opinion. So we turned around and commissioned this legal, by the way, I'm telling you this in, in, in very compressed time. This whole thing took, you know, seven years. Um, we turned to um, the CCLI, Climate, uh, Commonwealth Climate and Law Initiative, um, because what I said to them is I've, I've had, you know, occasional conversations um, with different lawyers. And, and, and the first answer I got was, no, you cannot do this because you'll be in breach of your obligations. And by the way, if you're ever challenged, you have the business judgment rule. That is your that is your tool to say, in my expert judgment, I looked at these issues and I concluded that my company, in light of the current regulatory framework, should not act. I kept looking for a lawyer who would give me the answer I wanted. And I got as far as, well, you may do it if you so choose, and you can rely on the business judgment rule to say that you've assessed the situation and in your expert judgment, actually it is justified to do this. The next question I wanted to understand is, is it a may we or is it a must we? And what this legal primer finally revealed, and this is by looking at 20 countries plus the EU 27, was that in fact, it is a must do, not a may do for all the reasons that you heard Janet explain. And by the way, a big thank you to Janet because she's the one who contributed the Malaysia section of this, um, re, of this primer. And, um, and so that, that finally cleared all the, you know, the confusion around this point. And we've overcome this one first gateway issue that was standing in the way of directors getting on with doing their job. So, you know, at this point, I gather we have an audience today that is roughly composed of 50% directors, 50% lawyers and student lawyers, roughly. I don't know the exact um, proportion. Now, to date, we as directors have been relying on the advice of our in-house lawyers and, you know, as I said to you earlier, the more backward in my view looking lawyers. And the legal advice we've been getting is don't do it. Don't do it because you're going to get sued. You're going to get sued for uh, you know, neglecting your duties or misrepresenting what the company can do. Uh, we just need to comply. Our job as lawyers is to advise you on how to stay within the law. So comply with the disclosure rules and you are sorted. In fact, what our primer reveals is that complying with disclosure rules is a starting point. When you disclose, you reveal information that raises very serious substantive questions about what you ought to be doing. Because if you look at the information that companies disclose and you look at where they stand in relation to what needs to be done to address the climate crisis and make the company resilient against the climate crisis, because that's fundamentally our job, you see that there's a gap. So disclosure is the gateway to action. You know, legislators cannot prescribe behavior in great detail, but they can prescribe disclosure. And it is through that prescription that directors then have an obligation to act. So, you know, I'm going to leave you with a couple of thoughts. One is senior lawyers, senior experienced lawyers, help. We need your help as, as directors. Young student lawyers, I know you guys are going to change things even faster than than your, you know, your more senior forebears who, like me and my generation, were a part of creating this problem. But I also want to say I'm kind of tired of old folks like me saying, the future is in the hand of our youth, they'll solve this, because that's just not fair. <laughs> so it really is on us. It is on us in the boardrooms. We have the power, we have the responsibility. We don't yet have sufficient knowledge 
but that's what we're working on. And Climate Governments Malaysia, working with all the other um, uh, fellow chapters of the Climate Governance Initiative, we are committed to, first of all, explaining to directors that this is a must do, not a may do and not a mustn't do, and that we have the tools to finally help them get on with it. So thank you very much. And, and, and I look forward to, to all your good advice. Fantastic. Thanks, Karina. So uh, immediately, uh, so you've just uh, uh, given us a, a little peek into a crystal ball, maybe a couple of years down the road for us, right? Because um, the, the question you said you were asking uh, when you were looking for, um, sorry, when you were appointed to the board of uh, any, um, is that first question that's come in in our Q&A box about whether or not public listed companies here should hire sustainability people have more diversity on their boards, right? So, so that's, that's, I think the answer is right there. Um, there is the need. But uh, I, I also want to have that, that observation about um, biz lawyers, about lawyers saying um, comply with the law and don't, do, don't, don't, don't step forward um, into that great unknown. As yep. well, ensure you have compliance, right? So public sector should lead us in the private sector, ensure compliance, we will follow yep. in terms of what the climate change is concerned. But what you're, in your experience, if you're sitting there waiting for that to happen, then trouble will come. Trouble will come because even if the lawyers are taking what they consider to be a cautious line, I consider it to, to be an imprudent line, um, investors are, um, are acting on this. They're not waiting for government to pass the laws because they see very clearly the damage that this does to their portfolios. And so investors have been pressuring us more and more and more um, over the years. When I first joined the board seven years ago, um, my investor relations manager would say to me, listen, um, only a minority of investors agree with you. Uh, most of them are either not bothering to raise it or their colleagues in the sustainability department are raising it, but the fund managers are behaving as if they didn't exist. So there was real fragmentation. 2020 was, I think, the turning point. And basically it's BlackRock, you know, BlackRock with its $9 trillion pretty much sets the pace for the market. So you can have plenty of people who are way ahead of them, but when BlackRock finally wakes up, it becomes an issue. So January, 2020, BlackRock, put this issue on the agenda in very, very clear terms. January 21, they raised the ante even more. And now it's in every discussion, certainly with companies on the front line, large emitters like oil and gas companies like mine, we hear this <laughs> irrespective of whether the law is telling us that we have to do this, the investors are telling us that we have to do this. Right, so besides regulatory risk, there's financial risk. And, and it sounds like climate risk is financial risk. Uh, Without a doubt. One main, one main pillar of it, right. So climate risk is financial risk. It's, it's business risk. Of course, it's also reputation risk and technology risk. But um, for us in very real terms, it's access to capital. So our sector has been downrated. Obviously the pandemic hasn't helped, but our sector has been downrated. It is harder mm -hmm. to raise money it's more expensive. It's not impossible by any means, but it's just more expensive. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, what we're doing is we're now issuing bonds that are explicitly tied to climate transition um, you know, outcomes huh. so that investors choose us because they're, they're basically betting on the transition by investing in us. All right, all right, fantastic. So um, uh, bottom lines, uh, pandemic, uh, Janet, I want to hear from you uh, in terms of what's what's the what's the flavor here, what's the temperature on the ground here, um, and I want to uh, thread this together with uh, one of the questions in the Q and A, which is um, how do we see the current position in Malaysia, where the country is dealing with COVID nineteen cases while trying to sustain the economy? Will climate change and sustainability and being sustainable we still be on the agenda of the private sector? So I just want to, so um, pulling that, uh, 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 you know, segue from the financial risk aspect, uh, Janet, what are your thoughts? I think they're both uh, the same side of the, the, you know, two sides of the same coin, actually. 
Um, and really, you know, the message there is that, yes, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, but uh, we also know that um, we were not prepared at the beginning of the pandemic when it, when it happened, um, not in the scale that it came. With climate uh, risks, uh, we already know that it is present and happening. And therefore, you know, this, this is what is called the green swan. You have to already have the plan to, to, you know, mitigate against it and have the steps. And again, I mean, you know, from an environmental viewpoint, even with the Environmental Quality Act, you already need to, as directors to avoid personal liability, have a plan to manage the risks and prevent the occurrence of the offence. And so the only way you can do that is to systematically identify the risks and come up with plans to mitigate against it. It isn't really anything new. Um, and uh, it's also like, you know, anti-bribery corruption, right? guidelines on adequate procedure. It's a similar concept. And just very quickly on this point on financing, on the other side, um, Karina mentioned investors, but you also have to look at your own financiers now. So only very recently, just last week, um, there's already a question of if we have a financing of a thermal plant now and, uh, you know, it's come to the end of fin that financing, we need to refinance it. Are we able to find financiers? And Ben Nagara has come up with a, a climate change and a principal place taxonomy guidance. And they're actually saying to banks, well, you know, you've got to look at whether you are investing in something that, you know, is, is sustainable for the future. And that has resulted in that specific example um, on a search for a financier who will refinance this project. So, you know, it is very real and very present. Fantastic. All right, so in practical terms, if I'm a, if I'm a company and, I, and, I, and, and these climate risks are materializing and I have done nothing, in terms of mitigating steps. So what's, this, what's the future going to look like from a financing angle for my business? Yeah, to, uh, to Karina and to Jenna. Karina, yeah. Sure, I think of Kodak and Polaroid. They, they were very complacent and they don't exist anymore. And my argument in the boardroom was exactly that too, because we supply you know, we produce barrels of oil and we produce gas. And, but really what our customers are buying from us is not a barrel. They're buying light and power and heat and cooling and mobility. And they're gonna buy it from somebody else who can provide it to them in a manner that is completely clean. So we need to get on top of this very, very quickly. We need to be one step ahead of our clients so that when they, when the, when it starts to snowball, which it will, just as it did in the investor community, we will be positioned for success. Otherwise we will be polarized. It's that simple. Thank you. So if I'm a director sitting on a, serving on a board of directors, um, and, and I've listened to this webinar today and I, and I feel like, oh my God, I need to do something. And I look up the primer on director's duties and climate change, then what do I do? Yeah, so what, what should, where should I start, right? Uh, if, assuming I'm the lone voice on the board. Well, to, back to the earlier question that somebody asked, you know, should boards just appoint somebody who brings a diverse perspective? Um, that's not enough because it's very easy for that one person to be effectively sidelined. Um, so you need, you know, and, and neither are you going to make up a board of, you know, all climate experts, that's not sensible. You need, you need diverse views. By the way, I'm not a climate expert. I'm just an expert at asking awkward questions <laughs> and keeping myself informed about what I don't know and ought to know. It's, it's that. Um, what, I, what I believe needs to happen is that, um, yes, boards should bring in people who have that sensibility, but chairs of boards need to make that effective. They need to say, uh, sorry, what does Julie have to think about this? Because, you know, Julie brings this contrasting view. Um, and it's, 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 it, that's where the governance comes in. That's where the board dynamics come in. And the idea that when you bring diverse views in, you include them in the decision-making. That's not always what happens. I can think of one very, very large, very large oil and gas company that you all know who appointed, I want to say five years, four years ago, one of the most highly respected atmospheric scientists in the world. No difference, no visible difference in what this company has done. 
So mm -hmm. it's down to the chairman. So yes, uh, and you know, Jenna, you might be uh, familiar with board disputes and. Uh, and so, you know, here, perhaps we lean much more towards that uh, we prefer collaboration, consensus, cooperation, and we, we're quite allergic to criticism, uh, constructive, you know, conflicts, right? So um, do you think if we have more diversity, as obviously this is what we need in boards, then how, how are we to approach the issue of these conflicts, right, these struggles between uh, chasing the financial bottom line performance, uh, but all these other uh, uh, interests uh, tied to climate change, climate risks. I, I think, you know, really at the end of the day, as Karina has said, I mean, you know, the, the dial is out there, the temperature is rising as far as investors are concerned. So we have already seen it here that shareholders have actually, I mean, you know, we, we, we know about the recent um, example with ExxonMobil, and how Energy Number One, uh, which was a very small fund, they basically put up, you know, um, I think there were five nominees, and uh, they thought the existing board was just too far behind. They weren't going to do anything to address the climate risks. And so we've seen it here too, quite recently, where you know we've had a shareholder nominate directors, and basically, you know, um, some of the existing directors were not reappointed because. The, the shareholder has a very big voice now, and it is very, very clear. I mean, it started very um, gently with the minority watch uh, shareholders watch group, but now more and more and more uh, shareholders, and, and Karina is nodding fervently, um, they have the power in their hands. And, and, and why? Because, you know, if the boards are not going to do something about an evident risk, then there is a question of whether as directors, they are acting in the best interest of the company. It's kind of simply that straightforward right now. And so if there isn't, coming back to diversity and all that, if there isn't sufficient knowledge, if the um, climate risks events pertaining to your business in the company is not so evident, then it is, it is actually a duty of you know, the, the board members to say, can we have an expert come in and tell us about it? And this is not one-off. This is a continual process because it's going to affect the way we plan, the way we strategically plan for the future of the company, and the way we adapt our present operations. And I think Karina would like to say something. Karina. It affects absolutely everything. It affects how we assess, how, how, we, how we design our portfolios in order to um, do our best to predict the future. It affects how we then um, incorporate these assumptions into our risk management frameworks. Those, those in turn affect our strategic planning. That in turn affects our capital uh, allocation decisions. By the way, this is one of the areas of, you know, a particular focus of investors is that companies announce that they're going to do stuff and then investors say, well, prove it. You're still investing 99% of your annual CapEx budget in the old business. Um, how can you credibly make the case that you're transforming your business when you're putting one or 2% in the new clean stuff? So, you know, the board has to, has to work with that. It affects, of course, remuneration because you need to pay people to do this. It affects human capital because you need to um, train your staff, change the culture, redeploy people who have skills that are becoming obsolete and recruit the right skills into your business. Um, so there isn't a single thing that boards do where this issue doesn't come in. Right, so boards must take leadership. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Now, I want to move on. Um, how about lawyers taking the leadership now? What is the role for lawyers and more than half of our attendees today? So um, maybe, Janet, can you talk about um, what practicing lawyers uh, ought to do, like uh, now, if, if they're new to this? No, absolutely. And, uh, you know, the phrase looking around the corner, it's never been more pertinent than for this topic. Um, and so, you know, it, 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 it is just a bit ironic uh, if you have a situation where, you know, nobody is looking at it because we're not, we're not used to having it on the agenda. It's just got to be front of mind right now. Um, and so as lawyers, uh, we need to help the clients look around the corner and say, you know, yes, we don't have as many climate related risks, uh, litigation against, you know, breach by duties of directors, but we are seeing it happening. 
Um, and, uh, you know, there, there is also a Climate uh, Change Act that's coming. Um, you've got to prime the directors on how, you know, and, and the primer um, actually has a very helpful list of questions, uh, which Karina might want to allude to, that boards would want to ask themselves, you know, is it on the agenda? Do we have sufficient knowledge, you know, and so on and so forth. So these are the things that, you know, as lawyers, we can, we can help remind our clients um, that it's absolutely important that you are on record as having discussed this, not just being on record, but because you want to do the right thing. Um, and uh, in the UK, in the, um, uh, the section on director's duties, there is actually an extra provision that you have to take into account um, all other relevant considerations, including the environment. We don't have that here, but common law, I would, I would submit, already requires you to do that to fulfill your duty of care. Mm. Well, insofar as climate change is a financial issue, the, mm -hmm. the existing law already That's... requires directors to act. They just need to have that realization that climate change is a financial issue. Yes, yes. And I'm sure there are in-house lawyers, um, in-house counsel uh, listening in as well. And Karina, what would you, what would you, um, you know, you're on the other side, but what would your advice to them uh, if, if, you know, for, uh, for them if they're new to this? Um, where should they start? Are you talking about where should lawyers start? Or where, where should, should... lawyers, in-house in -house counsel? Yeah, so okay. where should well, they? So hmm. it, similarly to investors, the first step is to um, educate themselves. And there are now, I'm aware of two initiatives that have just started recently of lawyers for climate change. That might not be the exact aim. One is for in-house lawyers and one is for um, you know, lawyers in law firms. And if you're interested, I'll get you the, the details. Um, and this is this brings lawyers together to, um, in the first instance, just learn, learn what uh, they need to know about the climate in the first instance, and then learn how that affects uh, the advice that they need to give. And then the second thing I think they need to think about is all of the advice that they give in all areas, whether it's M&A or financings or, uh, you know, negotiating um, commercial arrangements, commercial deals with, with, with any counterparty, a supplier, et cetera, is just as, you know, we've, we've, we've finally got it established that corruption has to be, anti-corruption needs to be a clause in, in contracts that, that, you know, that, that companies need to have um, the protections and the option to act uh, if their counterparty behaves corruptly or if an asset that they bought uh, turns out to have a, a corrupt past. Um, you need to think of climate change in a similar way that you're interacting with other parties and there is climate risk in there and we need our lawyers to help us um, protect us from these, these risks in the, in the way in which contracts are are being drawn up. And there's yet another initiative underway to address, address just this issue. The CCLI is involved in this. So helping develop sort of standard contractual clauses that can act as a model to help raise everybody's game in this area. I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I, you know, I look at this in a very kind of amateurish way, but it's, you know, in my, in my dreams, what would I like? I would like that. <laughs> I think, Karina, we're all learning in this, isn't it? So, yeah. um, and 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 that's, and I think I'm hearing from Jeanette as well. That's the, that's the really the mindset we we're exploring this together, uh, all of society approach as well. I think um, so. Yes, uh, I I was going to ask a, a question on the business judgment rule, but then I'm very conscious of the time. We are nine minutes past, and we've got some really good questions in uh, Q and A. Can we go through it together and? Uh, I, I want to give uh, the liberty to uh, both of you to, to uh, pick any question in particular you would like to answer live. Oh boy. Um, yeah. There's a final comment there. I know of an in-house lawyer who got a warning due to her advice to the company on issues touching on climate change. A common problem on speaking up. So you get asked to keep quiet and silence yourself. That is the classic problem that besets classic problem. every board. Every board. Yes. I just had the, a, I just had an argument yesterday with the secretary to one of my boards 
um, because I said, you need to say, you need to attribute to the speaker what was said. I don't want to read, it was commented, it was said, it needs to be attributed. And she said, if I do that, nobody's going to speak up. <laughs> and I said, if they're not going to speak up, they don't belong on this board. So, so yeah. this is this is a you know, this is a longstanding problem. Um, so, so not more just, dynamics. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. So not just uh, not just diversity for show, but a real safe environment for open yeah. discussion. Yeah. And again, I think that's down to the chairman and the committee chairman. You know, you need to create that space where people uh, don't feel like you know the kind of the oddball because they're raising a, a point um, that no one else thought of. Right. I, I did spot one question that um, that is this is the one on 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 Bursa pushing for sustainability reporting. I, I'm not in a position to obviously comment on the progress of that, but I just wanted to highlight that um, the the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, after ten years of basically doing nothing. Um, has uh, is now in the midst of, 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 a, of a massive consultation on how to um, tighten up its climate disclosure rules. They call them guidelines, but they're going to be mandatory. And um, and there is there. I mean, first of all, the Climate Governance Initiative made a submission, a quite detailed submission on what disclosure needs to look like. But the main point I want to make is that. When you have the EU, that if you read the primer, you'll see just how extensive the disclosure rules are in the EU. And they're in the process of being tightened up even further with the most recent um, uh, CSR directive, which is now being debated. Um, when you have the EU already having established, like set the bar at a very high level. And um, our argument to the US SEC is you need to get up to align with the EU, because if the two of us are there, then everybody is going to have to follow. You know, it's it just becomes the de facto standard. And as I said earlier, disclosure is not an end in itself, but it is an incredibly powerful means of getting people to change their behavior. So, you know, Bursa requiring better climate disclosure is a is a good thing. <laughs> Even though people generally don't welcome, you know, more red tape, it is a good thing. All right, thanks, Karina. Yes, most, most, yeah, I, I just most uh, definitely. You, yeah, Janet. Yeah, I just wanted to to agree, and then uh, you know the requirement is there. It's just going to. I think Bursa's position is that uh, it it's not compulsory to follow the guide that they've issued, but you are required to issue a sustainability statement. So it's just going to go further in that direction. And as we discussed earlier. Um, in order to ensure that, you know, you build in the risk, you've got to have that plan as well. And so when you disclose, you're not just uh, disclosing in the absence of knowing what the risks are and what actions the company is going to take. Um, so that, you know, you don't end up in a situation where there is actually a misrepresentation in the reporting. I think that is that the two things actually go line in line, hand in hand as well. Um, and um, I, I mean, I think that for the Bar Council, Environment Committee, there was a question on uh, Taman Rimba and public interest litigation. Please, please go and push for what Tan Sri Richard has mentioned, which is basically a right for citizens complain. So that public interest litigation by, you know, NGOs and the public can, can go forth. Um, I, I think that's something that is not there, which we, it would be very much welcome. Yeah. I totally agree. As public participation is key, that is another aspect of the pressure for this rationalization and preparing us against these risks. So uh, I'm gonna invite um, Karina and uh, Janet to give your final message or your call to action. Uh, and then we're gonna wrap up uh, this panel session. But for myself, um, I, 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 I have uh, listened and I, I think for the situation here in Malaysia, I think that our regulators have done a lot in terms of leading the way, providing guidance and, and, and uh, not imposing, so that is an easy transition uh, so far. Uh, it's guidance, it's encouragement, it's best practices, capacity building uh, for our, uh, local businesses. I, and I think business leaders should, uh, should um, take that and, and move with that and then take leadership and, and move forward. Uh, so Janet, uh, your final message call to action I in, would in one minute. In, in one minute, I would say, that um, 
the companies, um, you you are you are every opportunity for salvation. Actually, I mean, all the things that I discussed, they are the minimum um, bottom line, but ultimately, you know, lead the path for a better future um, because it is also going to help uh, the company and also going to help uh, you know sustain um, our environment in the future. So, so that that is something I'd like to say. Thank you, and Karina. I, I firstly agree. And secondly, I would say, when you have that little voice inside of you that's saying, we really should be looking at this, we really should be doing this differently, we really shouldn't be doing this, and no one else is saying it, resist the urge to keep quiet. Resist the urge to just be good friends with everybody. It's nice to be good friends with everybody, but that's not how things change and improve. So steal yourself and speak up and put up with, you know, my first year I got in the board review, I got comments like, she's always making comments that are just strange. <laughs> you just have to grit your teeth and, and be prepared to be the grit in the oyster. I'm not saying pick fights with people, by no means. I think it's always better. You, you, wouldn't, you catch flies with honey, but just stick to your guns and listen to your instinct and be that agent of change. In wherever you are, whether you're a lawyer or a board member, or you know, in in every in every role, there is a need for change and an opportunity to be that agent of change. Fantastic! And with that, I my big thanks to you, Janet and Karina. Thank you so much for your sharing and your thoughts and your insights. Thank you so much. Thank my you. Pleasure to be here. And Thank finally, you. Uh, just one last housekeeping uh, item uh, on in terms of uh, uh, for, for, for today's session. I've just uh, put a link in the comment box below. Uh, that's for uh, all of you to key in your to give us your feedback. Uh, it's a post webinar survey. Um, the front part of it is a CPD points uh, uh, um, collection registration aspect. So uh, for those of you who are not lawyers or chambering pupils, uh, you can just progress to the, the next section of the form. It's the same form. All right, um, thank you so much for the questions. I apologize, we didn't have time to go through all these high quality questions. Um, we will do more of these. Uh, now, it's my, I would like to hand over to Datin Sri Sunita uh, for your closing remarks. Sunita. Thank you so much. I'm sure everybody will agree with me. That was a terrific panel discussion. Thank you so much, Jaya, for your excellent moderation. Karina, Topo, and Janet. It's always such a pleasure listening. Um, you know, we started with a strong tone from the top from our co-host, the Bar Council President and the Chairman of the Environment Climate Change Committee. Tantri Richard then reminded us that it's also our responsibility to engage with companies. Uh, he suggested that the law is not only punitive in nature, but also there's restorative justice. Is it time to widen the local standard as in the Philippines where literally anybody can go to court to prevent pollution or any activity that might damage the environment? And this is something perhaps the Bar Council can act on as well. And then of course, it was such a pleasure to hear from the young students, ecology, uh, that change is going to come. Are you the one initiating it or are you the one resisting change? And what is history going to say? We're living on this earth as if we have another earth. And we are, at the end of the day, holding it on trust for the future generation. And then, of course, uh, in the panel that we've just heard, Topo and Janet raised some really excellent points, uh, which are going to be in the, that we're going to issue a blog post, which recaps the highlights, the recording is going to be available. Uh, and essentially, if boards are not acting on an extremely evident risk, then the question arises of whether they are acting in the best interest of the company. And bursa disclosure requirements are only going to take us further in that direction. So we really need to build in plans to manage this. And I loved Karina's experiences of working as a director. That was excellent. Uh, her point that legislators cannot prescribe behaviors, but you can prescribe disclosure. And that enables behaviors to change because you align, num you align behaviors when you align numbers, isn't it? And she reminded us about businesses which are very complacent and they don't exist anymore. Um, so, you know, there's so many points that were raised. I, I really want to leave all of us with this last thought. Are we all going to be on the right side of climate history? Change arises because we have the ability to discern what could be better and we have the skills to effect that change. And I would argue that every single person in this room has that ability 
and capacity to make a significant difference. We are faced with an opportunity, not just of our lifetime, of our generation, but in all likelihood as the last generation to be able to change the trajectory the world is currently on. We don't have much time. And as Tansri Richard suggested, why not invite everyone to help us manage this challenge? Why not allow individuals, NGOs to be able to bring causes of action if there is irreversible degradation of the environment and biodiversity? And when responsible and conscientious directors can accurately anticipate the direction of travel, we too can be a force for good and guide the business to long range value accreting measures, such as embedding sustainability into the very DNA of the business. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been such a pleasure to have you here. And uh, we look forward to future events with the Bar Council. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.